Hello, everyone. Our last speaker today is Diana Gelhaus, giving a talk titled Winning the AI Talent Competition. Diana Gelhaus is a research fellow at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown University. Her current research focuses on the U.S. artificial intelligence workforce and designing education and workforce policies that ensure our workforce remains globally competitive, cultivates diverse and sustainable pathways into AI jobs, and promotes equity in access and opportunity. Diana is also an adjunct researcher at the RAND Corporation, where she received her PhD in policy analysis. Prior to RAND, Diana worked at the Progressive Policy Institute, U.S. Export-Import Bank, and U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Please join me in welcoming her to the virtual stage. I'm Diana Gelhaus. I'm a research fellow at the Security uh, Center for Security and Emerging Technology, or CSET, at Georgetown University. And we're a think tank that's focused at the nexus of emerging technology and national security with a focus on artificial intelligence. I'm gonna talk for the next 15 minutes about winning the AI talent competition. It's an important topic, but not one that's well understood or well measured. Just to run through a quick agenda for the next few minutes, I'm gonna talk about what is this talent competition and why do we care about it? What is the state of the competition? First looking at the United States and then with our main competitor here, China. Um, and what does that mean for U.S. AI workforce policy? And really, it's education and workforce policy because we should be thinking about this in the short, medium, and long term. And last but not least is the role of industry, which is critical here given the structure and design of our education and training system. Let's jump right in. So what is this AI talent competition? I don't think that people even five years ago could have imagined how ubiquitous AI enabled capabilities, tools and techniques would have become across society. It is a technology of great strategic importance. It has economic implications. It has national security implications. And really this idea of leading in AI has become a really important and hot topic. But I don't think you can lead an AI without leading an AI talent. And I don't think that's well defined or understood. I also don't think that leadership is assured. While I think the US has a lot now, I don't think in the long term, given what's going on with our competition, we can take that for granted. And I think we really do need to be thinking about policies now and going forward. And I think that we need to focus with our, our main competitor, and that is China. So first, let's set the parameters a little bit of this conversation when we talk about the AI talent competition. What is the AI workforce? Typically, we've heard a lot about that top tier PhD computer science talent. They are a critical part of the AI workforce, but they're actually a very small part of the AI workforce. I think of the AI workforce far more broadly because I think AI is a team sport. And I think that there's a lot of technical talent that goes into this. So not just those computer research scientists, but thinking about your software developers, your database architects, your network administrators, your data scientists. And I'm also thinking about the product team, the people that complement um, and support the technical talent. And that is your project managers, your user experience designers, your compliance officers. And then you have people at that commercial level, the organizational level that really help make AI happen. And that's where you get into your acquisition talent, your procurement talent, your marketing talent, et cetera. And really here, we're counting the whole set of occupations. We're not just counting a slice of people that work in AI because I want to, I care about all of the people that have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to perform the roles and responsibilities needed to design, deploy, develop, acquire AI. So now that we've got that under the way, let's talk a little bit about why this workforce is so important. It's actually really large. When we think of this in a broader picture, like I have, it's 14 million people or about 9% of total US employment. This workforce is growing rapidly. It's projected to grow extremely rapidly. And then when you think about the concentration of talent, where are these workers? Who has access to this talent? We can see on this map here that the, there's a lot of urban clustering 
that's not terribly surprising when we think about, and this is in absolute terms, I should say, when we look at the relative share, so if we're looking at share of county employment, that's when you start to see the Washington DC metropolitan area bubble up to the top five. So we are still, regardless of whether you look at absolute or relative terms, it is a very concentrated workforce in urban clusters and that affects where you're gonna have access to this talent. We in our research, and I hope everyone will go check it out at some point on our website, talk a lot about the different demographic uh, related factors of this workforce. And one point that I really want to highlight here is something that you've heard a lot about anecdotally, you've seen in specific company reports on the demographic composition of their workforce. And we saw it here too in the data, and that is this gender disparity. And I choose to see that as an opportunity as we want to grow and cultivate this talent. Now we can talk a little bit about the actual state of the USAI workforce. And that is, is we've heard a lot about this broad brush assertion that there's this a blanket AI talent shortage. And what the data actually shows is it's a bit more nuanced than that. That's important for policy. We don't wanna just say there's this blanket talent shortage because then we're gonna design policies that aren't actually meeting the mark. So what is actually happening is a divergent uh, situation across different segments of the AI workforce. And what we found here is, so again, that top tier PhD talent, yes, we found evidence that there is a gap in supply relative to demand. Whereas for the rest of the non-doctorate technical talent, evidence is a bit more mixed. We do see evidence that pipelines are catching up to meet demand. Um, and, and we do see things like college enrollment and college graduation rates in computer and science and engineering uh, increasing quite rapidly. For the product team, commercial team talent, we're seeing a little bit, we, we don't really don't see evidence of a supply demand gap, but we do see the need to promote AI education across the populace and to promote AI literacy so that people can come into these occupations because these are gonna be huge opportunities for our future workforce. Thinking about the competition, and again, here we've been really focused on China and our research. And we're, our research on this is ongoing. You'll see more out of our, our, our publications on this over the next few months. But what we've done to date is focused on their talent output. So thinking about their education pipeline. And what I wanna show here is we've put out a paper, it's a much longer report on the uh, comparatively assessing China's AI workforce with the US AI, uh, sorry, education with US AI education. I hope again, everyone wants to uh, go check that out. But what I've got here is an imperfect comparison that's STEM uh, degree attainment, but it does provide a really good and useful indication of what's happening. On the left side, you see bachelor's degrees in STEM. It's not surprising that the Chinese output is much higher. They are a huge population relative to the United States. What's notable here is that share differential. So you can see that in terms of the share of undergraduates who are studying STEM relative to the share of US undergraduates studying STEM, that differential is quite large. Then when you're looking at that, again, that top tier PhD segment, which STEM is a bit more of a better proxy for, you can see again that share differential, but that the gap is widening. And I will note here, this is uh, the United States numbers include foreign born talent, which is a large share of US PhD talent in STEM, excuse me. And so when we think about policies, we wanna think about policies that brings in the immigration conversation and um, not only encourages students to come study in the United States, but allows them to stay. Then we really looked at AI education in the United States relative to AI education in China. I'm starting here with the United States. And what we see here is a product of the design of our education system. It provides opportunities, but also a lot of challenges. And not surprisingly here, AI education is quite piecemeal, varies state by state, varies by school district, varies by the availability of teachers and resources and prioritization of the school. 
we are still in large part focused on integrating computer science into the classroom. So still about half of high schools do not have computer science education. So we're still working on that piece. Um, and AI education continues to be very computer science oriented as opposed to being integrated in the rest of the curriculum. That said, we know in our education system that a lot happens outside of the classroom. And this, again, is where industry has a huge role to play. We've cataloged 650 education-related programs, um, a lot of which are sponsored by industry. This is after-school programming, summer camps, educator materials, contest hackathons and challenges. So industry really here has provided a lot of access to AI education. It's just still a bit of a wild, wild west. Um, and then thinking about the bachelor's level, here is important as I get to the next slide because we're still focused on computer science undergraduate degrees. We really don't have AI explicit majors yet. Whereas at the master's, we're seeing a little bit more of that in addition to some AI adjacent fields like data science really emerging. And then at the PhD, we are seeing more explicitly AI doctorates being offered. This compares to China. I could talk for 15 minutes about what's happening in China. So I really encourage anyone who's interested to check out our paper. But at the K through 12 level, the Ministry of Education or MOE has mandated AI curriculum in the classroom industry there is helping design those textbooks in that curricula. At the bachelor's degree level, the Ministry of Education has to approve every major that's being uh, offered across the university system there. They've approved 345 to date, and it is currently China's most popular major. So they are really investing a lot in growing and cultivating AI talent. Now, what does this mean? So going back, pulling together some of the threads of, of what I've discussed here, I've got three policy goals. One is focused again on that top tier talent, growing that pool of US born PhDs, and also making sure we have policies in place to retain uh, top tier foreign talent that, that chooses to study in the United States. Uh, sustaining and diversifying the non, uh, technical non-doctorate pipeline, and then promoting AI education or AI literacy for everyone. We put out another report uh, on policy recommendations. I am definitely not going to go through all of these recommendations here, but these are what I think we need to um, grow, sustain, diversify the USAI workforce in order to strengthen, secure, and maintain our lead in AI talent. So right now, sure, the US is ahead in the AI talent competition, but again, we really do not want to take that for granted. And I think there are actionable steps in the short, medium, and long term that we can take to help promote uh, what we need to do to, to help make, continue that edge, to grow our talent um, domestically, and to make sure that we are the place where top talent wants to continue to go. And that starts at the top with a federal coordination function, which I think is really important given all of the piecemeal, very innovative, but piecemeal initiatives that are happening across the country. Um, and, and again, at the state level, and even across federal agencies, there are 16 federal agencies that we've counted that have some sort of AI or AI adjacent programming. And so just to have that coordination piece, I think is really, really important here. And promoting alternative pathways into the workforce. And this is where I will end with this role of industry because I think it is so important for industry to help create these alternative pathways, to help make them legitimate, to really establish that the market signal is there, that people can go come into AI and AI adjacent careers without a bachelor's degree. We're not there yet. And I think to really grow and sustain, sustain the US AI workforce, we need to have these pathways in place. What, what else can industry do? I think that there is a lot industry can do, and I'm really excited to follow this conversation over the next few years because I actually think people don't say it explicitly, but that industry is a huge part. They are a stakeholder and they are a participant in the US education and training system. So not just partnering with schools, which is really important to continue to help design curriculum, to provide resources to integrate AI into the classroom, um, thinking about the different 
AI applications, thinking about educators and students, but also upskilling their own talent. We've interviewed companies and there really isn't the right incentive structure in place that, that encourages upskilling in AI and AI adjacent fields, or that encourages partnerships with community and technical colleges. We're starting to see that. And I think that's a huge growth opportunity. But I will just conclude that we can maintain our lead. We can secure and strengthen our lead in AI talent, but we really need to all work together. And I think there, that there's a roadmap we can do to make that happen. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you so much. Please check out our report online. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you. That's it for today's general session. Before the other sessions begin, we will be hosting our own town hall, which is an open Zoom discussion titled Biggest AI Fails, What Went Wrong and Why? If you'd like to join the session and talk about this subject, use the link in the swap card session and turn your camera on. The session will be directed by two moderators and everyone is welcome. If you aren't crazy about Zoom networking, we'll see you at our first talks beginning soon. Enjoy. Mm -hmm.